Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 37 of Advanced Linear Algebra. Today we're going to learn all about how the singular value decomposition relates to other matrix decompositions that we've seen so far in this course and also gives us even some new matrix decompositions that we haven't seen yet. Okay, so the first one that we're going to look at is sort of a new one. It's related to something that we talked about in introductory linear algebra, but it was sort of implicit. We didn't explicitly go through the details. Okay, so here's the setup. Suppose that you've got some matrix, it's got real or complex entries so that you can do a singular value decomposition on it. And let's just say that it has rank R. Then it turns out what you can do with that matrix is you can always write it as a sum of R rank one matrices. Okay, so you can write your matrix A that has rank R as a sum of R rank one matrices. These matrices over here, I mean, this is a scalar, this is a column vector, and then this is a row vector. Whenever you have a column vector times a row vector, remember that gives you a matrix, but in particular, it gives you a, a rank one matrix, okay? So this is a scalar multiple of some rank one matrix, which is still a rank one matrix. So I've written A as a sum of R rank one matrices. Okay, but furthermore, something even more special is happening here. These aren't any old vectors. They're actually orthonormal sets of vectors. Okay, so these U's, they're all orthogonal to each other. And these V's, they're all orthogonal to each other. So we don't just call this a rank one sum decomposition. We call this an orthogonal rank one sum decomposition because you can choose these vectors to be an orthonormal set as well as those vectors there. Okay, and where this comes from is, well, it just comes immediately from the singular value decomposition. We'll prove this rigorously in a second here, but you really should be thinking of these U's as the columns of U, and these V's as the columns of V, and these little sigmas as the diagonal entries in our big matrix sigma. They're the singular values of the matrix A, okay? So the notation really means what it suggests there. Okay, and the reason why it's sometimes useful to think of the singular value decomposition in this way, sorry, in this way, rather than in the matrix product sense, is it lets us think of breaking our matrix down into sort of pieces, okay, into R pieces. If it's a rank R matrix, then we break it down into R pieces, and each of those pieces tells us something about the matrix, but furthermore, the pieces are sort of you know, they're sort of organized there. The largest singular value is the biggest piece of the matrix, and the second largest singular value is the second biggest piece of the matrix, and so on. So it sort of breaks down the matrix into rank one pieces and sort of organize them into most important pieces and least important pieces. Okay, and we're going to come back to that idea again next week. We'll come back to that, okay, and pin it down a little bit more precisely. Okay. And in fields other than R and C, it turns out the same theorem holds, not quite the exact same because you don't have a no notion of orthogonality unless you're over a field like R or C where you have inner products and all that. But over general vector spaces, over general fields, well, you can still have the same theorem as long as you don't require orthogonality. If you just want linearly independent sets, then it's still true. So in particular, you can still write a rank R matrix as a sum of R rank one matrices. You just don't have this extra orthogonality condition. All right, so the orthogonality really is what the singular value decomposition gets you here. All right, so to prove it, what we're going to do is, well, we just start off with a singular value decomposition. Start off with, hey, A equals U sigma V star, where U and V are unitary. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write things down as explicitly as I can. So write U down in terms of its columns. That's all I'm doing there. And then write V down in terms of its columns. So V star in terms of its rows. Okay, and then write sigma down in terms of all of its entries, right? Its diagonal entries are sigma one up to sigma m, and then it just has zeros everywhere else. And here, for the purposes of this proof, I'm assuming that m is less than or equal to n. In other words, I'm assuming that the matrix has fewer rows, or at least no more rows, than columns, okay? So we've got then just a bunch of zeros over on the right-hand side here. That's all that means. Okay, if it's the other way around, if it has more rows than columns, the proof is pretty much the exact same, okay? It's just you have to write it differently. You'd have zeros down here instead. All right, and then from this step, all you're doing is we're gonna do block matrix multiplication. And I'm gonna start off with this product on the right here, okay? It's just a diagonal thing times something written in terms of rows, and it's straightforward to check that, okay, so I just copied down this U here, that doesn't change, but then, you know, sigma one just goes across this first row V1 star. And then sigma two, that hits everything in the second row V2 star, all the way down to sigma M, hitting everything in the mth row, Vm star. So what you end up getting is this column vector here. Well, it's, I mean, it's sort of a block column vector. It's actually a matrix that I've just written in terms of its rows, right? Okay, and then one more block matrix multiplication step. It's just this matrix times this matrix, which just looks kind of like a dot product, right? It's just U1 times this and then plus u2 times this, and so on. So we just get this sum here, which is almost what we wanted, except if we go back and look at the, the statement of the theorem really carefully, 
we don't want the sum to go all the way up to M, we want the sum to go up to R. Okay, we want the sum to go up to the rank of the matrix, not M, not the number of rows in the matrix. But that's okay, these two sums are actually the same, right? If you sum up to M or you sum up to R, you get the same thing. And the reason for that is just simply that all of the singular values after the Rth one, they're all equal to zero. Sigma R plus one, sigma R plus two, all the way up to sigma M, those all equal zero anyway, okay? So all of the terms after the Rth one, are just nothing, they don't contribute to the sum. And that's it, that's the whole proof, okay? So the proof is just take the singular value decomposition, but express it using columns and block matrix multiplication. Okay, and that just falls directly out. Okay, so let's compute one of these things. Let's construct an orthogonal rank one sum decomposition of some matrix, okay? And well, let's pick this matrix just because we already have a singular value decomposition for it at our disposal, okay? We computed a singular value decomposition of this matrix in the previous lecture. Okay, so I'm just copying and pasting the singular value decomposition that we saw for this matrix from the previous lecture. Okay, so we computed this at the end of the previous lecture. Here's my U piece, here's my sigma piece, and here's my V piece. Okay, and you can check that these two matrices really are unitary if you like, if it makes you comfortable. All right, so once you have your singular value decomposition of your matrix, to construct an orthogonal rank one sum decomposition of your matrix out of it, all you do is you express everything in terms of columns, okay? So you just do sigma one times the first column of U times the first column of V, but star, and then plus the second singular value, and then second column, second column star, okay? So it's just, and here the rank of the matrix is two, right? You only have two non-zero singular values, so there's only gonna be two terms in the sum. You could do a third term in the sum if you wanted, but it's gonna be zero times something, so it doesn't actually contribute. All right, so here's our rank one, orthogonal rank one sum decomposition, and what it is, well, what's sigma one? It's root six, okay? And then, this piece, this is coming from you. I've got one over root three times one, 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 and I've got one over root two times, well, zero, one, one, zero. Okay, so that's the first column of V star. Okay, and this one over root six, it's just the one over root three times the one over root two. All right, and then the second term in the sum, it just comes from sigma two now. So sigma two is two, that's out in front. Okay, and then this column, hey, that's the second column of U. Okay, one, zero, minus one. And then this is the second column of V, but starred. So now it has a row vector. So one, zero, zero, minus one. Okay, and this one over two out in front here, that just comes from, well, there's a one over root two here, and there's a one over root two there. We multiply them together, we get one half. Okay, so that's our orthogonal rank one sum decomposition right there. Maybe it's worth actually simplifying this a little bit though. Maybe it's worth actually going one step farther and sort of uh, multiplying out these terms to see what we get. And maybe this highlights a little bit more another way of thinking about why it's called the orthogonal rank one sum decomposition. If we multiply out this entire term here, we get this matrix, zero, one, one, zero in every single row. And if we multiply out this entire matrix, we get this guy right here that just has entries in the corners. Okay, and if you look at these, yeah, this matrix is rank one, and this matrix is rank one, and furthermore, I mean, they're orthogonal in the Frobenius inner product, right? If you take the trace of the product of, you know, this guy star times this guy, or if you just sort of the, do the dot product of matrices, you'll see that these matrices, they're orthogonal to each other with respect to the standard inner product of matrices. So they're orthogonal rank one matrices. And they really do add up to that matrix A, right? If we just scroll up a little bit, you can see, I mean, yeah, add these two guys up here, you do get this guy, okay? So it's a way of breaking down a matrix into orthogonal rank one pieces. Okay, well, so that's sort of a new matrix decomposition that comes uh, to us from the singular value decomposition, but there are a bunch of old ones that we've already talked about that we can also get from the singular value decomposition. So to start off, let's talk about the polar decomposition, okay? We introduced the polar decomposition last week, but we didn't show how to actually compute it. Well, now, thanks to the singular value decomposition, we will know how to compute it because the singular value decomposition and the polar decomposition, they're basically the same thing, just written in a different way. Okay, and to see that, suppose that you've got some matrix and you write down a singular value decomposition of it. And then suppose that you want to construct a polar decomposition of that same matrix from that singular value decomposition. Well, the way that you do that is you just cleverly insert a V star and a V in the middle here, okay? So this, if, if this equation for A holds, then certainly this equation for A holds too, because this V star V just cancels out. It's a unitary matrix, right? Okay, but if you write A in this way, what have you got? Well, here over on the left, that's a unitary matrix, right? U is unitary and V star is unitary. And if you multiply two unitaries together, you get a unitary matrix. And over here on the right, what do you have? 
Well, that's a positive semi-definite matrix, right? Sigma is a diagonal matrix with positive entries on the diagonal and V is unitary. And we have that theorem that says any matrix of this form is positive semi-definite. That's exactly what a spectral decomposition of a positive semi-definite matrix looks like. Okay, so that's a unitary times a positive semi-definite. In other words, that's a polar decomposition of A. Okay, so it's easy to construct a polar decomposition from a singular value decomposition, but you can also go the other way. Okay, if you have a polar decomposition of a matrix, so if you have A equals U times P where U is unitary and P is positive semi-definite, okay, well then what you can do is you can just construct a spectral decomposition of that positive semi-definite piece. Construct a spectral decomposition of P, write it as V D V star, right? And we know how to compute spectral decomposition, so you can actually do this in practice, okay? And then just plug that in and see what you get, okay? If I plug V D V star in up here, then I get A equals U times V D V star. In other words, I get this equation here. But now just look really carefully at that. That is a, a singular value decomposition of A, right? Because you've got unitary times diagonal with positive diagonal entries times unitary. And that's what a singular value decomposition is, okay? So that's it. I mean, that's the other direction. That shows that you can go from a polar decomposition to a singular value decomposition as well, okay? And in fact, if your matrix itself is positive semi-definite, then something really nice happens. The singular value decomposition actually turns out to be the exact same thing as the spectral decomposition. These two different decompositions are the exact same thing if you restrict your attention only to positive semi-definite matrices, okay? And the way to see this is suppose that you start off with a positive semi-definite matrix A, just do a spectral decomposition to it, okay? So write it as U, D, U star. Okay, well, because it's positive semi-definite, you know the diagonal entries of D, those diagonal entries, they're gonna be real and bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, well, that's enough. That's literally all you need to know. That tells you that this is actually a singular value decomposition because what do you need for something to be a singular value decomposition? You need a unitary on the left, you need a unitary on the right, and you need a diagonal thing in the middle with non-negative real diagonal entries. That's it, okay? The only thing that's different here is the two unitaries, they happen to be the same thing. So the U part and the V part, those are the same, okay? And as an immediate corollary of this, if your matrix is positive semi-definite, you actually know right away that its singular values are the exact same as its eigenvalues, okay? This is not true in general. It couldn't be true in general, right? Because singular values are always real numbers that are bigger than or equal to zero. Eigenvalues can be complex junk, even for real matrices. But if your matrix is positive semi-definite, then your eigenvalues you know are real and bigger than or equal to zero, and actually they're equal to the singular values. Okay, so for pos positive semi-definite matrices, they're really, really nice. These two different ideas, eigenvalues and singular values, they coincide. Okay, something similar, something sort of similar, but not quite the same, not quite as strong happens for actually all the, the entire family of normal matrices, okay? So suppose that you've got some normal matrix then it turns out the singular values of that matrix, they equal the absolute values or the magnitude uh, of the eigenvalues, okay? So remember, if it's just some arbitrary normal matrix, it's eigenvalues, they can live anywhere in the complex plane. You can just have arbitrary complex numbers as your eigenvalues. Well, if you take the absolute values of those or the magnitude, then you're gonna get a positive or at least a non-negative real number, and those numbers are your singular values of the matrix. Okay, so the way to see this, again, it's very similar to the argument that we just up, did up above. Okay, we're just going to do, do a spectral decomposition of your matrix, right? A as U, D, U star, where U is unitary and D is diagonal, except there's the extra wrinkle now of the diagonal entries of D, they're not necessarily bigger than or equal to zero, right? So they're not the singular values. They might be negative, they might be complex, okay? But we can sort of fix that in a sense, okay? And here's how you do that. Here's how you get a singular value decomposition out of the spectral decomposition. What you do is you notice that, hey, every diagonal entry of D, in other words, every eigenvalue of the original matrix A, it can be written in polar form, okay? And remember the polar form in the complex plane is something that looks like this. We're gonna write it as Rj times E to the I theta J, where Rj, that's a bigger than or equal to zero real number, okay? And E to the I theta J, that just, that sort of specifies the angle uh, of the complex number in the complex plane, right? Okay, so RJ, that's the absolute value of DJ, and this e to, e to the I theta J, that's, you know, the number on the unit circle in the complex plane that specifies the angle of the complex number. 
So if you do this, something really nice happens, okay? So we're gonna write down the spectral decomposition for A again, except now we're gonna split apart the matrix D in the middle a little bit, okay? So we're gonna write D as, you know, a diagonal matrix that just has the, these numbers on the unit circle in the complex plane times the magnitudes of those DIs, okay? So if we were to multiply these together, because they're diagonal matrices, you just multiply them entry-wise, and you'll get like, e to the i theta 1 times r1. Well, that's d1. That's the first diagonal entry of d. And then e to the i theta 2 times r2, that's d2, the second diagonal entry of d, and so on down the line. So this, this product in here really is d. Okay, but the point of doing it like this is then we can regroup things a little bit. When we write things like this, this entire product on the left here, this is unitary. Okay, and the reason for that is, well, u is unitary, and this matrix here is unitary as well. Whenever you stick numbers that are that have you know modulus one that have absolute value one along the diagonal of a matrix, well, that's a matrix that's normal and it has eigenvalues all with you know absolute value equal to one. That's a unitary matrix, right? You can just double check that this matrix times its own conjugate transpose. Well, yeah, it, it is going to equal the identity matrix. You're just going to get each of these times their complex conjugates along the diagonal, and this number times its complex conjugate is just one. Okay, so you're gonna get ones along the diagonal identity, okay? So this matrix is unitary. So this is the product of two unitaries, which is still unitary, okay? And furthermore, now this matrix over here, it's still diagonal, except now it has bigger than or equal to zero real numbers along the diagonal, right? Each of these is the absolute value of some complex number. So now after you take the absolute value, they're bigger than or equal to zero real, okay? So we're gonna call this matrix here sigma. And then what have you got? You've got a unitary, times sigma times a unitary star. That's what a singular value decomposition looks like. This is a singular value decomposition of the matrix A. Okay, and the way that you figure out what the singular values are now that you have a singular value decomposition is you just look at, well, what are the diagonal entries of sigma? And they're just R1 up to Rn. In other words, it's the absolute value of D1, which is the first diagonal entry of D, which was the first eigenvalue of A. So the first singular value, it's the absolute value or modulus of the first eigenvalue. Okay, same with R2. The, the next singular value is the absolute value or modulus of the second singular or second eigenvalue, and so on down the line. All of the singular values, they're just absolute values of eigenvalues, okay? Be careful though, this argument only works for normal matrices, okay? So if your matrix is normal, then singular values, they're absolute values of eigenvalues. Great, we have a nice theorem. But if your matrix is not normal, don't make the mistake of thinking that's true, okay? So here's a counter example, okay? If A is the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, this matrix is not normal, okay? And it's straightforward to check that the eigenvalues of this matrix, well, they're just one and one. And the reason for that is because it's upper triangular. We know every triangular matrix, your eigenvalues are the diagonal entries, okay? So we can just eyeball them to see the eigenvalues. Okay, to compute the singular values, we got to do an actual cal calculation. You know, you just compute A star A, and we're going to take the square roots of the eigenvalues of this matrix. So, say, okay, so we got to compute that matrix first. It's just 1, 1, 1, 2. You do your matrix multiplication, and then you compute your eigenvalues of that matrix. It turns out that they're 1 half uh, times 3 plus or minus root 5. Okay, so ugly eigenvalues. They are what they are. And then your singular values of the original matrix are the square roots of these eigenvalues of A star A. Okay, so the singular values of A are, well, the largest singular value, sig sigma 1, is the square root of the plus branch, and then the smaller sig uh, singular value is the square root of the negative branch, okay? And in particular, the only thing we care about is that these singular values, they do not equal 1, okay? They're just some ugly decimals that equal some other junk, okay? They're not equal to 1. So the singular values do not equal the absolute value of the eigenvalues in general, okay? That's only true for normal matrices. Alrighty, so that will do it for this lecture and for our first week of lectures about the singular value decomposition. So I will see you again for lecture 38 when we start talking about next week's material, which is sort of more applications of the singular value decomposition. This week has been very theoretical, has it connect to matrix decompositions and this sort of stuff. Um, next week, we're going to look at all sorts of new stuff that we can do now that we have the singular value decomposition at our disposal. So I'll see you then.